Good morning. Um, each year, I seek the Lord for like a big theme for the year. So in 2016, our big theme was faith. And if you're attentive, you would notice last year that a lot of our series kind of centered on the topic of faith. This year, as I was seeking the Lord and, and, and talking with the staff and stuff, it seemed uh, apparent to us that uh, the theme should be relationship. Um, body relationship and relationship with family and this and this world and so this winter we're going to enter into a series now uh, entitled becoming uh, the church becoming the body Um, and it's all about uh, having this goal of understanding and doing church the way that God intends becoming this organism this living body uh, of Jesus Christ when you look at the church um, oftentimes people look at it more from a structure standpoint like the institution but really, uh, the two other ways of looking at the church are a living organism, the body, uh, and also as a, a family kind of thing. And so this winter, uh, becoming the body is all about the organism, the, uh, the, the uh, kind of interrelatedness side of church. And then this spring, we're going to enter into the more the family side, uh, understanding that aspect of what it means to be that kind of a body, how to relate to the world in that way. Also, where we begin to really truly value other people. And so this spring, we're going to do another series entitled Family Matters. And so I pray by the end of the next few months, your understanding of church will be different than it is today, uh, because I think we tend to uh, default to the church as an institution, and there is that aspect of church, um, but it's meant to be so much more than that, and it's meant to be something that becomes this vital part of our existence, and I pray that that's what God does over the next uh, uh, a few months. So, three common models for church are organization, organism and family we're going to look at the organism and family side over the next few months now to dig deeper into this uh uh adventure this winter there are several groups that are kind of following along with what we're doing here on sunday mornings i'm looking through the book of first corinthians which will be our text for the next uh, uh, few weeks um, and digging deep into what what is this thing the church, and what does it mean to become to the body of Jesus Christ? So I'm going to echo the advertisement that's already been said. If you want to get into a group, and maybe for the first time, jump into one of those groups that are are, are going to go kind of along with what we're doing on Sunday mornings, and dig deep, and struggle, and, and, and contemplate what does it mean to be part of the body of Jesus Christ. And remember, you can just go out to that kiosk out here and sign up for those groups after church. So today we're embarking on a 13-week series from the book of 1 Corinthians that will inform us on what it means to be the true community of Christ, what church ought to be. And hopefully over the next 13 weeks, you'll then obtain a very biblical understanding of the church of the Lord Jesus. And I think 1 Corinthians is just perfect for this uh, adventure. I'm going to start by reading verses 1 through 3 of 1 Corinthians this morning. It's the greeting of, of the Apostle Paul to the Corinthian church, but boy, I tell you what, it's more than a greeting. So listen to what he says here. First of all, let me just qualify uh, and give you this introductory thought. Really what Paul begins here to do, even in his greeting, is give us a vision. And his vision is this, a vision of community for God's people. That's Paul's vision. As he even begins his uh, letter to uh, to the Corinthians and to us, he has a vision of community for God's people. Listen to what he says in verses one through three. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother uh, Sothenus to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's a vision I think that Paul already begins to identify here in the greeting, and it's this, that as a body, as a group of people, as the church, we are to be a sanctified, holy church. Let me give you some brief definitions of some key words in this greeting. Sanctified means to be separate from the ordinary or common use. So whenever you hear the word sanctified, it means you are separated from the ordinary and you are on task for God. Holy means believers of the gospel call, one whose moral and spiritual character then bears the image of God. We are people bearing the image of God as his church. 
And church means called out ones. Called out ones. It's the local meeting like we're experiencing here this morning. It's the assembly of the true people of God. So Paul begins his letter to the Corinthian church with a picture of what church ought to look like. It should be made up of people who understand that then Jesus, they are not of this world. We are not of this world, amen? We are called out of this world. We're extraordinary. We're not ordinary. We're not for common use. We're for God's use. Our moral and spiritual character should bear the image of God, and collectively, we have to see ourselves as called ones on mission for God, furthering his kingdom. So that's the vision that Paul begins this letter to 1 Corinthians with. And then, secondly, Paul clarifies his audience as the saints. Now, he uses the word holy ones in the NIV, the New International Version of the Bible that we read this morning. If you were to go to the King James Version of the Bible, he would use the term saints. So Paul clarifies, I'm writing this letter to the saints. Let me talk to you for a moment, okay? Just, this is a little bit off the message, but you'll, I, I want you to get some of the heart of what I'm going to share this morning. Whenever you have a meeting like this, and Paul had the same thing happening in his day, there are two groups of people here, essentially. There are those of you who are true believers. You love Jesus. The Holy Spirit has filled your life, and you're living entirely differently because of that. There are some who are here because mom and dad said you have to be here. I mean, that's the reality of it, right? There are some who are here because of guilt or obligation or a spouse has said, you need to come to church with me, and you may not even be on board. There are some of you who are just curious, and you're just checking it out. You you don't know about this Jesus thing. Well, guess what? That's what makes church kind of messy. Because people will look at those who attend here, see you maybe out in the community, and and maybe you're not a believer yet, and you're acting like a person who's not a believer. And they'll say, well, that's what that church is all about, right? And I want to say this, first of all, if you're checking us out, even if you're here out of compulsion, I'm glad you're here. I praise God you're here. It will make church a bit messy, though, okay? Okay? But that's okay. We may even be under, misunderstood. But that's, that's what we want. So there's two groups of people that really make up a church meeting. Now, Paul is not addressing this to the ones who aren't there yet. This letter is addressed to those who say, I'm a believer. I'm a saint in Jesus Christ. That's who this letter is addressed to. And Paul's really addressing in the Corinthian church their problem of this libertine attitude, this anything kind of goes attitude, uh, God will just put up with me, I can do anything I want. And that's what he really addresses throughout uh, this hard-hitting epistle dealing with church. Let me give you some background on the Corinthian church, and maybe this will be uh, instructive of of why this libertine attitude was infecting their their meetings and their, their church. They were located in the town of Corinth in Greece, along a major uh, trade route, and they had just thriving economy. I mean, they were doing really well. The people were um, caught up in wealth, but they were morally impoverished uh, uh, by and large. Not unlike our culture today. I remember years ago when uh, President Clinton at the time and some other people were kind of getting called out on their immorality, yeah, they came up with a campaign slogan. Now, some of you may not remember this. I remember it vividly because I thought, oh, just like the Corinthians, they said, it's about the economy, stupid. You remember that? They are basically saying, it's not about morality. It's about having a what? Big old fat wallet. As long as people have a big old fat wallet, they're happy. Morality doesn't matter. That, my friends, was the Corinthian experience. And that attitude was kind of affecting the church. And as we'll discover in the weeks that lie ahead as we get into the book of 1 Corinthians more in depth, they were riddled with all kinds of real problems. They were very carnal. Um, They were giving in easily to the desires of the flesh. They were a real divided group of people. Uh, Lots of divisions uh, uh, among the Corinthian church. Uh, We're going to talk about that, by the way, um, next week. Um, They were immature and misusing spiritual gifts. They didn't address this really drop, mouth, open kind of sin in their midst. Um, They they went to court to settle matters between themselves. Um, They couldn't even do communion right. Does that sound like the vision Paul just shared in the greeting? To be a holy, sanctified church. It, It doesn't. And here's the problem. 
a phrase in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3 kind of sums up the shortcoming of many in the Corinthian church. They were living like mere men and women. Therein lies the problem. They were living like mere men and women. They were supposed to be Christ-led, spirit-filled folk, um, you know, and, and, and experiencing this wonderful interrelational thing called the body of Jesus Christ, but instead they were living like mere men and women, as though the Holy Spirit wasn't in their hearts. I strongly believe we face the same kind of problems that the Corinthians face. And I think God's going to use this series to speak to us. I hope, I pray. <laughs> My prayer is that you and I are both really humble and honest. And that we let God's word really pierce our hearts. And we let his Holy Spirit really convict us where conviction is needed. I love what Pastor, and where comfort is needed. I pray he comforts us. But I pray we begin to be the spirit-filled, Christ-led group of people really meaning it, amen? Really experiencing it, that we become this holy church, this holy habitation, this group of sanctified people. Now, Paul ends his greeting by saying grace and peace to you in, in the name of, of, of our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I have begun to love that. I have been, I, it just has been speaking to me so much. Any of you ever experienced any stress in your life? Anybody feel stressed out this morning a little bit? Do you? No, you guys are just at peace. Praise God, amen? Lately, I've been going through some things that have caused some stress, and I have been kind of um, getting back to simplicity. I talked to Pastor Aaron. He gave me a couple of really great books to read, and they've just been gripping my heart. And one of the things that God's been instilling on me is that I am to experience his peace. It is a gift. Jesus says, my peace I give you, not as the world gives you. And I've been going back to some simplicity in prayer life. Uh, we're into this, you know, complexity kind of thing by and large as people. But part of the problem is God often takes simple concepts and, and wants to really instill them into our hearts, but we can't do that until we, are, are, we really meditate on them and chew on them a little bit. And sometimes stress is the catalyst that forces us to do that. Amen. And so sometimes now when I'm feeling like a little stressed out, I begin to say, God, you are faithful, and you have promised me peace. And I declare to my soul peace in the name of Jesus Christ and by his blood. And I pray that over and over and over again. And I know that some people say, well, you're not supposed to have vain repetition in your prayers. That is not vain repetition in prayer. That is seeking to be spirit-filled and led by Jesus Christ, okay? And sometimes it takes a lot of repetition for something to go from here to here. A lot. And you want to have so much repetition going on here that at some point when you feel stressed, your heart just goes, I have peace in Christ. It becomes your expression. It becomes very natural. So if you're really getting stressed out by life, I want to encourage you, find some key scripture that speaks to you, that speaks of the adequacy and sufficiency of God, and begin to speak that over and over and over again in your mind until it becomes part of your heart's rendering, okay? Um, then Paul ends, of course, by saying we have grace, too. We're going to talk on that a lot, so I'm going to leave that for uh, a few moments. But individually, we're supposed to be filled with grace and peace, and collectively, then our church should be a place of what? Grace and what? And, and peace. So this is our setup for the next 13 weeks as we go through a, a, a good portion of 1 Corinthians 13. So we're going to begin this morning where Paul begins, with a declaration of what we have in Jesus Christ. We're going to look now at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 through 9. And what we're about to read in 1 Corinthians, I call great nutrition for body life, for being a healthy body. And Paul gives, identifies three keys, three keys that are, are, are just Absolutely essential to becoming the body that God intends. And that's what we're going to focus on this morning. Listen to the scripture. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way with all kinds of speech and all knowledge. God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So in a church so divided, so riddled with problems, you have to wonder, why did Paul begin by declaring this really rich, 
picture of what the community of Christ is all about. Uh, several explanations are offered for this beginning uh, uh, to this letter. I want to talk to you quickly on a couple of those because I think they merit just a quick mention. Some think Paul was praising the Corinthians because he wanted to soften the rebuke that would follow. Okay, and there's several of them that follow. I once heard a, a, a person, and the, he was sincere in saying this. He said, when I have to discipline somebody, I begin with praise, I discipline them, and then I end with praise. You know what I call that? A bologna sandwich. Now, if you like bologna, this is going to taste good to you. But when you look at bologna, it's about the most worthless meat ever. Now, if you like bologna, go ahead and eat it. I don't, you're not going to get any condemnation from me. But it's full of nitrates and worthless nutrition, okay? So no matter how you dress up a bologna sandwich, no matter how good the bread is on each side of that thing, still at the center of it is what? A piece of bologna. And it is just simply not good for you, okay? So I always say when people say praise, discipline, praise, you're giving that person a bologna sandwich. No matter what you say, it's bologna, right? Is that a little too straightforward to you today? I know if you do this as a parent to your kid, if you think, well, I got to discipline my kid, I'll praise them, then I'll criticize them or discipline them or whatever terminology you want to use, and then praise them, you're going to cause that child to be neurotic, because every time you say something good, they're going to start twitching. What's going to come next? Because they're going to lay the hammer down on me now. And not, no, praise them when they need to be praised. And when there's discipline, discipline. And love them no matter what you do with the love of Jesus Christ. All right? I don't think Paul was softening up the Corinthian church for the rebukes and tough teaching that would follow. I don't think that. Now, kissing cousin to this explanation is that Paul was just trying to build up these poor Corinthians because after all, they had such a rough life. Paul never did that. No one is writing to say, oh, you poor Corinthians. Nobody has it as tough as you, so I'll praise you just a little bit so that you can tolerate my tough teachings that will follow. Paul never said anything like that. He always said, in Christ, we can overcome. In Christ, we can do more than we ever think we can do. In Christ, we can do all things. His model constantly was that Christ changes everything. By the way, these Corinthians, they weren't shy about what they were doing wrong as we'll see as the series unfolds, they would do something wrong and they wouldn't even try to hide it. No big deal. It uh, reminds me of a misbehavior that some of my children went through, uh, and you, some of you with younger children will relate to this. It seems like at some point they figure out how to draw really well, and then they draw on the wall. Has anybody experienced that beside us? Several of our kids made these wonderful pictures like that on the wall. Well, I remember one of those occurrences happening. There's this great, nice, penciled drawing on the wall, and then very neatly below it was the word Brie. My, my second born had just learned how to spell her name and write her name, and so she did this nice creation on the wall, and then she signed off on it. We knew who did it. It was great. After laughing for a bit, we kind of addressed it and said, you know, you shouldn't really draw on the wall. And uh, that was that, but the Corinthians were like, scribbling all over the wall, doing all kinds of things wrong, and signing off on it. They had no shame. They had no uh, hesitation. And they were just doing these wrong things. And, and, and Paul's addressing that. You ought not to be like that. Um, you're claiming to be spiritual, but you're acting just like the world. You're acting like mere men and, and women. When Jesus comes into our hearts, he transforms us, right? The Holy Spirit changes us. And we don't, we don't love those former things that used to master us, that used to cause us to fall and sin. We begin to love the Jesus Christ. We begin to love the ways of God because the Holy Spirit is sanctifying us. He's setting us apart. And we're becoming the holy people of God that he intends, right? We shouldn't be scribbling on the wall, signing off and saying, God, just put up with me. That's a total misunderstanding of, of grace. Johnny had been misbehaving, and mom sent him to his room. After a, a, a time, he emerged and said uh, he had thought it over and had a prayer. Mom said, hey, that's great. If you pray and ask God to help you do better, that's fantastic. And Daddy said, oh, I, I didn't do that. I prayed that God would allow you to put up with me. So you think on that for a minute. That's exactly what the Corinthians were doing here. They were saying, God put up with us. And they had a total misunderstanding of grace. 
that God would just overlook my wrongs and just put up with me. But God's grace is to transform so that your former life loses its grip on you. Not very many people will say out loud, I'm just going to do what I think I want to do, even though it's wrong, and God will just put up with me. But you know what? Sometimes our actions just scream that, don't they? You may not say it, but the way you're living your life is illustrative of it. I don't think Paul shared these introductory thoughts to soften what he had to say to the Corinthian church. Rather, I think he was trying to establish an overarching thought that's supposed to kind of reside in our minds as we read this great epistle of 1 Corinthians. It's what I call the promise. In Christ, in Christ, we can become the living body he intends. Amen? In Christ, we can become the living body he intends. The question becomes, will we believe it? That's what I hope you take away today. If you forget everything else I say, I hope you remember this. In Christ, we can become the living body that he intends. In Christ, it can be done. You and I can become sanctified people. We can become separated unto God's glory. We can become holy, uh, you know, living uh, a morally and spiritually different life because Christ is leading us and the Holy Spirit is filling us. And we together can become the church that God intends us to become. Let me put this into a sentence. In Christ, you can become the person God intends and you can become part of the church that he desires. Do you believe it? I believe it with all my heart. This is God's plan for you individually and his plan for us collectively. Now, unfortunately, the word church in our culture has lost its meaning and significance. But I think God wants to redeem it. He wants us to begin to love the term church and becoming the body of Jesus Christ. We just have to have the right view of it, amen? And we have to step into what God intends for us. And Paul identifies for us here in the scripture I read to you this morning three keys that will make this promise of becoming a, a, a living organism, a living body in Jesus Christ, a reality. Um, I grew up in the Twin Cities in a suburb, Brooklyn Park. Um, cars got broken into. I remember a little Corolla I had. All the windows were smashed out one time. People just do stuff like that. And so I grew up in that kind of environment, and it wasn't uncommon to see some locks on a door like this. People thought, if one lock is good, I might as well put four or five on there. At least I'll make it difficult for someone to break into my uh, shed or my house or whatever. Well, there are like three key uh, locks here that Paul gives us a key to unlock to become a healthy you know, church, a healthy body. And so what we have to do is put those keys in, unlock this puppy, and open the door uh, to healthy church living. That's what we're going to do here the rest of the morning. Key number one is grace. Key number one is just grace. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul thanked God for the grace given to the follower of Jesus Christ. Our church's vision statement is what? Pastor Aaron said it today. Encounter, you guys are bad. Encounter what? Growing, become grace givers. Yeah, you ought to be able to just say that in your sleep. Grace is so important. And the problem with the Corinthian churches, they didn't get grace. They thought grace meant God will put up with whatever I want to do, my libertine attitude. I can do whatever I want to do, and God will just put up with it. No, that's not at all an understanding of grace. Grace comes from the Greek word charis, and it means the divine enablement of God. The divine enablement of God. God doing in you what you cannot do in yourself. Here's the theological definition. God's unmerited, favorable disposition toward sinners on account of Christ. It's empowerment. Are you getting the action element of grace? It's not God just putting up with you. It's not God just overlooking things. It's this enablement because when he fills you with his Holy Spirit, you're a person of grace. Things change drastically. I have an acronym for grace. It's God's resources at Christ's expense. It's God's resources at Christ's expense. So it means so much more than I'm forgiven or God will put up with my sinfulness. It means I have in Christ a new creation thing happening, I have a new heart thing happening, and I have a new identity in Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit now lives in me, and he's transforming me, and I'm not what I used to be, and I'm becoming what God intends me to become. We're to have that experience individually, and what? Collectively. We're to become the body of Jesus Christ. So key one to unlocking the door to healthy church is grace. Now we're ready for key two. It's 
gifts. And when I use the word gifts, I mean spiritual gifts. Paul declares in our reading this morning that, you know, the follower has been enriched in every way and that he or she does not lack any spiritual gift. There are three main groupings of spiritual gifts identified in the New Testament. I'm going to run through these really quickly. But I want you to get the full orb understanding of that term, spiritual gifts, and what Paul is implying by it. Over in Romans chapter 12, we have one listing of spiritual gifts. These are often referred to as the motivational gifts. These are the gifts of prophecy, serving, teaching, um, encouraging, giving, leading, and mercy. Now, God imputes that to a follower. When you become a follower of Jesus Christ, he imputes to you a gift of the Holy Spirit, and you begin to kind of see the world that way. That's why they're called motivational gifts. These gifts determine why you do what you do and how you see the world. So if you're gifted as a prophetic kind of person, you're going to see the world kind of black and white, right and wrong. You're going to have a high sense of doing what's morally correct, and you think everybody else ought to too. If you're merciful, you're going to look at situations and you're going to just bleed for other people and sympathize with them. We need to have all these gifts be manifested and rubbing against each other so that we have a healthy, full-orbed view of what it means to be a Christ follower. If you think you don't need the church, you're going to have one of these gifts dominating you and you're not going to represent Christ very well. Get this? So, Motivational gifts in Romans 12 are are our first gift package. Second one is the ministry gifts found in Ephesians chapter 4. Now, these gifts are for equipping and promoting service in the body of Jesus Christ. So, the gifts are pastor and teachers and helps and those things listed there. Here is a gross misunderstanding of my job. I'm here to minister. You're here to receive. No, I'm here to equip. You're here to minister. Got it? That's healthy body understanding. I'm not here to do all the ministry. That's a classically wrong understanding of pastor role. You're here to do the ministry. That's the fun part of following Jesus Christ. Amen? You're here to get involved in this kingdom and this kingdom's promotion. Uh, Listen, a healthy body helps others. And, and, And so if we're a healthy body in Jesus Christ then we should be helping others, amen? That's what we do, right? And so, so these ministry gifts are for the equipping and the promotion of service. And lastly, we have manifestation gifts, and they're, they're found in 1 Corinthians 12. Uh, these gifts make the power of God visible. They're the gifts like miraculous powers, word of discernment, word of knowledge, speaking into the tongues, whatever. There's a whole list of those. You can read them there in 1 Corinthians 12. They manifest the power of God. They make the God visible. They make him known to people, and they're just, they're just fun gifts. Now, get, get this. Where to get this understanding? In Jesus Christ, we are not mere men or women. Are you getting that picture yet? We are not mere men and women because God's grace has been given to us and spiritual gifts have been given to us. So spiritual gifts are like the second key to unlocking the door to healthy church. Key three is guarantee. Key three is a guarantee. And the guarantee is this, Jesus will keep you strong till the end. Jesus will keep you strong to the end. Uh, We're living a life that's kind of hard. And, 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 and Paul begins his letter to the Corinthians saying, listen, you're not in this alone. You have a faithful God who will keep you to the end. The Corinthians face a culture just like us, full of temptations, full of uh, distractions and, and temp- temptation and all that kind of stuff. And I don't know about you, but at times I go, I am so utterly exhausted by the constant battle it seems like we're in. And, and, and we're being told here that God will keep us to the end. He is faithful. He has guaranteed this. I call this the gift of a cross-country runner's heart to the people of God. Now, I wouldn't have said that a few years ago, but I've had two boys of mine running cross-country, and I've gained a lot of respect for that sport. They don't run in that sport unless they have this humongous heart. It is just a brutal sport, and I, to today, don't understand why anybody does that. But I noticed that to be a good cross-country runner or whatever, they have this huge heart for running. They just love to run, and they have this desire, and they'll overcome all kinds of pain and doing that kind of thing. And I, I think what God is saying to us here, and what he's promising by this guarantee is, listen, the race you're going to run is kind of hard, but I'm going to give you a big heart for it. 
because I'm faithful. Recently, I was listening to a fictional book um, with Vicki on one of our trips, and the author of the book wrote this, or one of the characters said this in the book, life is this simple. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. That's the story of everybody's life. The problem is the middle is so long. And when you think about a cross-country race, the hard part's the middle. Because <laughs> you're running, you think, can I finish this thing? Am I going to throw up? Is it going to you know, be able to finish to the end? And that's much of life. If you have little kids right now, you think, oh, this will never end. Yeah, it does. Trust me. My little guy's 21. It ends. It ends faster than you think. And, and I think what God is saying and promising to us here is, I am going to give you the heart the endurance, the guts, the grit, whatever term you want to use, to run the race I've marked out for you, I guarantee it, because I'm a faithful God. And I call that getting a cross-country runner's heart. So, Paul begins Corinthians with an affirmation of what the follower has in Christ. You can become the person that God intends And you can be part of the church that God desires. Because in Christ, you have grace, spiritual gifts, and a guarantee. I declare to you today, you are not mere men or women, amen? You are not. If you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you have grace, spiritual gifts, and a guarantee. So here's our conclusion this morning. There is a community of saints that is really supposed to happen. I'm looking at them. There is a community of saints that's really supposed to happen. In Christ, the church has marvelous resources. Grace, spiritual gifts, and a guarantee. So we could be more than mere men and women. Dream with me for just a moment. What would happen if we truly believed this? How would that change, church? How would that change our impact in this community? Consider How is it with my soul today? Am I willing to be part of this? That's how I'm going to end this morning. Would you bow your heads in prayer, please? God, I thank you that we're often kind of running in this 1 Corinthians study on becoming the body. I've shared already quite a bit here, so I pray you give us all capacity to muse on what you're teaching here in 1 Corinthians to us already. God, you have a vision for us to become this true community of saints, this sanctified, holy people, set apart for your use and and for your glory, um, that we're not just mere men and women, uh, but we're spirit-led or spirit-filled, Christ-led people. So I pray, God, that we would have just the ability today to believe on this, not to have excuses of why it can't be, but to begin to say, okay, God, I'm, I'm open to this. I'm open to being, you know, Christ-led, spirit-filled, and I'm open to becoming part of the collection of the saints who are really the true body of Jesus Christ. God, I just pray that you would uh, grace us, that you would fill us with those spiritual gifts, that we would cling tightly to your guarantee this morning that you are faithful and you will keep us to the end. For anyone here today, Lord, that is not a Christ follower, or maybe is for the first time thinking, wow, I've never heard any of this before. I don't even know what it means to follow Jesus. I pray for such a soul today that they would just yield to the promptings of the Holy Spirit right now, and that they give their heart to you, Jesus, as their Savior and as their Lord, and they would begin this wonderful adventure of being a Christ follower. And I pray that we would look at ourselves collectively and think of what could be in Jesus if we really become this body appropriating these three keys of grace, spiritual gifts, and a guarantee to us. That we really believe that, Lord, that we really take a hold of it. God, I just pray that, that everyone dreams with me. What could be, what would, the, what would the organism of church really look like? What would it mean to be the living body of Christ here? God, we love you so much. Pray all these things in your name, Jesus, and all God's people said, 